So it's kindness, unconditioned friendliness. It's a choice. It's a choice we make to incline the heart toward goodwill for all beings without exception. That requires a I like this phrase, the words leaning in or turning toward to remind me that it requires some effort, some action on my part, this kindness to the effort to be in intimate with other human beings, to be an honest, kind relationship. and to be able to stand grounded, firm, when discomfort arises, when we disagree with maybe how someone's living their life or their political views, maybe someone in our households even, someone close. And leaning in opening the heart to arising and allowing it to flow through. Right? Not trying to push away or avoid or minimize, but respecting this as part of our relationship with one another. not being blind, right? Blinded by or blind to the way things are. Not blind to color, not blind to gender. Neither blinded by or blind to our own anger, rage, history. When we don't turn toward, like Ella says, we get caught up in what we think and we believe it's the truth. And then we look for affirmation, confirmation of our truth, right? We like being reassured when others share our views. <laughs> Even if we don't like our own views, we want other people to dislike our, our view along with us, right? We want that familiarity, alignment. And when, we, when people don't align with our views, we get on guard, we're guarded. Right? We don't want to be challenged. Yeah, and maybe we're a little less friendly with those who don't share our views when they're not on the right side. And that's when harm can happen. When we stop being careful and tender with one another. And so that really like that raises the question for me, how how do, we, how do we use this path, this practice to pull ourselves out and maybe others as well of ignorance, hatred, greed? And I think the, the answer is the path itself, right? In Buddhism at least. Fortunately, there are many paths, <laughs> many maps. And if we pick up one and are steadfast, we'll, we'll find our way to these heart practices, to kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, 
equanimity. And in a lot of these maps of in Buddhism, you'll find some recurring stars, right? And Metta is certainly one. And I like talking about Metta because it really tells us how to live in this messy, complicated world with messy and complicated relationships. And the precepts are a really clear uh, path or guide to how to live wisely. Right? And probably one of the more classic paths to liberation is the Eightfold Noble Path, right? The three prongs of wisdom and concentration and morality. And sometimes you want to start with concentration, you know, solo, we can do that alone, bear down and accomplish something. <laughs> and wise mindfulness, wise effort, a bit more than bearing down and being able to zero in on a singular object. But I like talking about like, mm, that metta is what informs our, our action. So we have the wise action, um, and the Eightfold Noble Path, and that's a sort of the how, right? The, the wisdom, wisdom track of the Eightfold Path, there right? is uh, two like really important foundations for living skillfully wise view, wise intention. So wise view, most simply understanding the law of karma, the nature of things. And when we get out of our own way and drop our stories, set aside our expectations, we can begin to see the impersonal, impermanent nature without imposing or rearranging our own sort of distorted manipulations of the way things are. And the heart practices show up here too on this wisdom path. It's like the, the minds, intentional function connects these intentions we set, chanting these phrases, intentions we set in our practice with what we actually do. Mm -hmm. Do no harm. That's the precepts. Don't cause harm. Don't abuse the body. Don't abuse the body with substances. Be truthful. And don't take what's not given. And be nice <laughs> and generous. Right. Like that's the formula for showing up with wisdom, showing up in relationships skillfully. This intention. It's like, what are we setting in motion? What, how are we showing up in the world? And again, like, just don't be stingy, right? Don't hold it on stingy or greedy. Be nice, it's a theme, <laughs> be nice and do no harm. 
intentions that are not rooted in greed, hatred, and delusion. The Buddha's words on loving kindness are commitment here. Freed from hatred and ill will, freed from drowsiness. Maybe not sleepiness, though it could be literal sleepiness, but not awake to the way things are. By not holding to fixed views, a pure hearted one, having clarity of vision, and being freed from all sense desires. And we send the wish, may all beings be at ease. All beings. Whether whether they are weak or strong, the great or the mighty, medium, short or tall, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born. May all beings be at ease. And we, each of us in our practice and our relationship with one another help create these conditions. So this universal wish of happiness and well-being. There are behavior, sila, ethical behavior, wise speech, wise action, wise livelihood. And for me, this is like, this is the place where our practice, it really hits, rubber meets the road, right? This is where we act out those intentions that we have been cultivating. So these the metta phrases that we may recite in our meditation, not necessarily a wish for an outcome, but more of a, a wish to understand, right? What, to have wise view, to understand the law of karma. And with tenderness in our hearts, to feel the impact that we have with one another in relationship. And then the action, responding wisely from this heart mind that's been transformed. And so it's not a stretch for any of us in our speech. Like, yeah, that's reasonable, abstain from lying, divisive and abusive speech, be truthful. What's more loving than truthfulness? I've certainly had conversations with loved ones, friends, and maybe not even someone so close that have deep appreciation for one's capacity to be honest and truthful. Whether it's a message I want to hear or not, ultimately I feel cared for. I feel there's been, there's some regard for me. And why speech is also abstaining from idle chatter. I love the, the acronym WAIT, why am I talking? Filling space, soothing anxiety, maybe. And speaking at the right time with affection and goodwill and for the benefit of others. Like those are those are the elements of wise speech. And again, that care regard for 
each other is embedded there. It's not a passive sitting on the pillow wishing for this goodness to arise. We cultivate it in our actions with one another by talking to one another. When we don't talk to one another, we possibly get this idea of harmony without actually having some insight or understanding to the true real differences that exist between us. And it's, it's not those differences necessarily that create separation and divide. But our difficulty or perhaps unwillingness to be interested in those differences and hold those in relationship. So if we don't, and when we don't, look into or acknowledge those differences. It's the story, right? One of those stories. We create story, we have perceptions of who people are, who groups of people are, how they should behave. And when, we, when, when the mind is left unchecked, right? unchallenged, all that feeds our emotions and thoughts and beliefs. And it's so easy for us to get activated when something challenges our story, our perception, or we get, we get activated and we're swept away back into something that maybe has long since passed. And here we are in this present moment, acting out a hurt, trauma, memory from long before. I think that's sort of the definition of papancha, right? It's the cycle of adding layers to an experience, adding layers to the story proliferation of thoughts and feelings and interpretations, judgments, <laughs> fears, all of these mental creations, the mind. And we act it out. We play that out in relationship with one another. And use it for a basis, possibly, for not being kind to one another, not caring for one another. Part of the story is sometimes that we can't be kind because we don't really like the person, <laughs> right? So we're coming back to if they're not aligned with our views or the way that we see the world. It's not actually a necessity, a requirement for metta, for care and consideration to like someone. We're cultivating the goodness in our own hearts. Whether they're weak or strong, <laughs> omitting none. So we sit in silence together. We chant the Buddha's words on loving kindness so that we can better face one another rooted in loving kindness, rooted in generosity, standing in integrity, wisdom, patience, 
to see each other fully, to see ourselves fully, to see each other fully, and not turn away. It's not a pass. It's being seen and seeing others fully, just as we are. So it takes a pretty steady, strong, mindful practice to bridge this sort of gap between what we intend, what we say, and then what we actually do, how we are actually showing up in relationship with one another. And so this uh, commitment to wise intention renunciation, harmlessness, and goodwill. It's the way, <laughs> it is the path, all right? Don't be stingy or greedy, just be nice and try not to cause harm. It's not a, uh, complicated formula. <laughs> right. There's this um, uh, author that I, I pick up sometimes. His name is David Rico. Uh, he authored a book, How to Be an Adult in Relationships. So when I find I'm uh, not being quite skillful in my, my marriage, a few words by David sometimes will get me back on track and he was uh, describing uh, sort of the effect and uh, impact of like truly accepting and allowing one another. And I love this, I love the way that he talked about it. And it just, I, I use it to describe a meta, quite honestly. So a kindly support of your path, no matter how unusual, <laughs> of your feelings, no matter how disturbing, of your deficiencies, no matter how irritating. <laughs> and I like that because that's, that's where we are. There's, it's not flowery, right? It's gonna be, might be weird, right? <laughs> A little unusual and uh, some disturbing feelings or thoughts, right? We have no control over the thoughts that arise and sometimes they are disturbing. And our idiosyncrasies, right? They're irritating someone, somewhere, <laughs> some of the time. And still, we are deserving of kindness, that unconditional regard. And we sit to expand our own capacity to offer that. And to just walk through the sort of the fires together of being in relationship with people who are different and complicated. To be able to turn toward each other. And not just turn toward when it's easy and nice. And also turn toward when we're confused maybe afraid and with this practice of sitting together studying together creating a space where we can lean in we become more willing to expose our hearts expose our vulnerabilities Maybe our guilt, our anger, our fears. And we can start to share with one another the stories we've been told and the stories that we tell ourselves. And we begin to feel safe enough 
to be vulnerable, unedited, as we share our stories. I've been uh, reading Isabel Wilker Wilkerson's uh, book, Cast. She also authored The Warmth of Other Suns. The Warmth of Other Suns was a, a history of the great migration of African Americans from the South. And Cast is a very in depth storied exploration of our history of divide, racial divide in this country. Uh, it's very graphic and personal stories, which make it undeniable. And there's a, a chapter is recalling time in history when it was a social spectacle, the you know, torture and lynching of African Americans and families would dress up and gather together. And postcards would be created, mail, people would mail these postcards to family all over, collect souvenirs from the bodies. And as I listened, it, Many things arose. <laughs> One is this deep tenderness for those young children, also the parents. Like, what? How does that heart feel to take your child to witness a torturing? And those children some of whom may be someone's living great grandparent right now. And how is the heart that has carried that experience for decades? And I, I was quite surprised at my own heart softening in this way. I became really curious about that experience. And really would, I would, I would love to be able to have the conversation, right? We talk about being vulnerable not being edited, but to talk to my friends about what that's like to know your family's histories, your family's participation. And I really think that until, until we can turn toward one another and fully begin to understand, acknowledge what has been, what is difficult to feel, what has been difficult to attend to between us as human beings, not only between racially different human beings, turning toward that chasm that has grown between us, that keeps us fearful of one another, guarded against one another. When we don't turn toward one another in that way, for days, for weeks, years or generations, we see precisely the unrest that is 
that's happening in our streets and our communities across the country right now. And we don't name our collective karma. Frustration, grief, numbness, rage, Zenju uh, Earthland Manual says it this way, which is far more eloquent than what I'm saying. This tension is our most sacred time. To access the sacred time, we must have common ground. We must stand at the water together with all of our problems. Many of us consider being human to be our common ground. This perspective can negate our unique differences and end up causing more tension. Being human is not enough common ground to navigate challenges. If we could consider our common ground as trust, we would be more able to remain open to the struggles. What are we trusting? We are trusting that what happens between us is the path by which we must come to awaken as human beings. We must stick to this path with great integrity, no matter how difficult. And so we can sit together and acknowledge that we are different we disagree, and we can do so without hatred, without ill will. We can be different from, an, from one another without someone or something having to be wrong. And so the question I ask you is these heart practices, setting these intentions toward kindness, guiding our actions. What are these practices asking you to let go of? What hurts or harms have been passed down from your parents or your ancestors? And how have you, how have you faced them? What, where in your life do you need to turn with metta? And that's what we practice to understand. We sit to study the mind, to know the mind, to understand what motivates us. Training the mind, again, taking action, taking responsibility for the disposition of the mind and how, how we play that out. And this liberation that we aspire toward. We get there through these intentions, the intentions that we set. This kindness can be the antidote to fear, 
three conversion. So I'm taking the power out of doubt, expectation, disappointment. So this practice is not about willing, about sort of bearing down, making loving kindness happen, but opening our hearts. To meet our experience skillfully When we are shocked, when we are disappointed, confused. And kindness. And not because I say so, or the Buddha's words on loving kindness say so, but because we have that direct experience. We felt it in our bodies after the meditation. We know what it feels like to be kind. And the heart's capacity is limitless for kindness. And there is a limit to the heart's capacity for hatred. It literally kills people. I don't know if anyone has ever ended a Dharma talk saying it literally kills people, but that is the end. <laughs> it's a laugh. Thank you. <laughs> um, we have a few minutes if anyone has questions or would like to share or has reflections. 